Hi, thank you so much for that great information and for the opportunity to be here with everyone today, virtually. Um, let me just tell you a little bit about me. My name is uh, Steve Henson and uh, age 46, no symptoms, no idea what a prostate was. I was trying to uh, get into Boy Scout camp as an adult leader and after about the third year of asking my doctor to sign my health form, he said, no, he said, I haven't seen you. And uh, so I saw him, he signed my form, said, have a good time. Um, no discussion, I don't know, I didn't know what a prostate was. Called me on a Saturday and I uh, said, I think, I think we have a problem. And uh, so it started my journey. Um, it was, uh, it was really scary, it's a dark time for me. Uh, I was a single dad, 13 year old son. Um, I, I would just, I went through it, you know, and made my way through it, met a, a really great guy who couldn't have came from a different walk in life. I was kind of a privileged white guy, an African American guy that had, had came on through some hard times, but we had this one thing in common. And so we, we helped leaned on each other. And uh, within a year, I learned out that I had a family history and it had been kept secret. And uh, so we started uh, somewhere along that way, um, decided we needed to pay it forward and we wanted to have something in Kansas City for the other men that came behind us. We thought we were still kind of alone. We were just two of us, you know? So that's, that's me. And then what did we turn it into? Um, we started meeting um, a library and eventually a, a great organization came to Kansas City called Gilda's Club. And uh, we managed to get connected through uh, some like-minded people and uh, they gave us a home and we started meeting and uh, it, was, it was really powerful. Um, some of these guys that uh, had already gone through it were really naturally gifted at helping have those newly diagnosed guys come in and find out they're not alone. So we didn't know a lot, but we, we knew what our experiences had been. And so what happened was the community started embracing what we were doing. And uh, a lot of African-American churches invited us. Um, all sorts of things just kind of happened. People wanted us to, they knew there were survivors out there and they wanted them connected to what we had to offer. And uh, eventually it led to uh, uh, our first big one was with the Kansas City Royals. We did a prostate cancer awareness stay out at the K. And uh, it, it really kind of launched, it was on Father's Day. and. Uh, I was honored to sit in the buck on ALC. So it came with all sorts of awareness and we're can't wait to get back out there and do it. We've done it a number of times. And uh, that that's really kind of how it goes. We, we invite others to include us because if you make prostate cancer an event, ain't nobody going to show, but uh, so we just kind of hijack things like baseball games. So that's, that's us. And uh, we were meeting two locations. We uh, eventually started a uh, location over, uh, originally on the plaza and then went out south in Leewood. We did them quite different. Um, eventually we started bringing in speakers because there was a lot of information. Some doctors, but also we had nutritionists, people running gyms, uh, uh, psychologists, mental health experts, all sorts of interesting people, other people that had gone through it to share their stories. And, uh, then we, we had a second location out south, and we did that different. We, we found that having speakers got in the way sometimes of actually having the men talk. And also we found that having the ladies and the guys in the same room also inhibited conversations. And so when we started out south, we, we met in two rooms. We had two different places, and so we would kind of separate the couple. We'd all kind of say hi together, and then we would, we would separate, and we found that to be highly effective in uh, really getting the men to open up um, when the door is closed and the only other thing in the room was other men that had gone through or were going through the same things. And then the same thing with the ladies, they had such a different set of needs. And so one of the guys, wives was a, uh, a therapist. And so she kind of championed that up and has done a great job until the COVID's hit. And so and now we're, we're doing it virtually and making the best of it. And so um, if you know people that are going through this, we, we still have that. And I'll talk about what I think the keys to support are. We've been doing it now for 10 years, talked to thousands, maybe 10,000, I don't know how many, there's so many. It turns out there's like 3 million of us living with this stuff. 
we found that key is to listen um, and especially like an educated ear. So if you can have gone through, you can, you don't have to be raw, raw. You don't have to be, it's okay to be pissed off. It's okay to be scared. Um, but to listen. And so to have those like-minded guys listening is super important. They need to know that they're not alone. And, uh, I, I tell you, it's so moving when you see one of these guys come in and they think they're, they're right on the cliff. They think that they are, uh, they've, they've heard nothing but bad things as far as their prognosis. Even when it's not that bad, they think it's that bad because because if they don't have, they don't understand, they make assumptions and the assumptions are always worse. And so you get them alone in a room with other guys that have gone through this. Uh, those guys can, can, they literally touch them. And, and you, you would be surprised how you see guys cry. You see guys Tell them that you love each other. And uh, if, if you didn't see it, you wouldn't believe what happens behind those doors. As far as connections, you know, they're everywhere. So I, I'll give you an example. Um, I had a family history, but we didn't talk about it. So, you know, we, we give away stuff. And the idea is like cell phone holders and tools and stuff like that, because we want things in the hands of the survivors in their houses sitting around where that secret comes out because if their family knows then they know they can share talk about the risk factors and they can support each other um everyone is affected by a diagnosis of cancer it, it affects the kids um i dealt with that myself with a 13 year old son um assumptions are made and men are bad at talking about a lot of things and so if you're not talking about hard things and then people have to have answers and they come up with, with the wrong, the wrong ones. Um, friends can be too. Um, it's, it's everywhere. There's so many people affected by these things, but when people don't talk, it's hard to find them. I'll give you an example. Uh, one of the, the favorite things that, uh, I've been invited to do over the years was to address churches and uh, I'll get up there and I'll talk about the statistics. You know, sometimes we do it in the basements on a Saturday, but a lot of times on Sundays, there's been some churches that have held blue weeks here in Kansas city. And, Oh my God, they're just beautiful. The congregation wears blue. We get a survivor to throw a few statistics out there. And one of my favorite tricks is I'll say, you know, now, now that you kind of know this, how many people out here, are dealing with that or know someone close to them that are dealing with it you know could you could you stand up or raise your arm and they do and, and I tell them I said before you sit you know before you put that arm down just look around the room and here is what happens they haven't told all these people that they know they love they spent all this time with and they've kept a secret I'm like there's your new support network so they've got somebody that they see on a regular basis and now they know, and they can go meet uh, for coffee. They can meet and go for walks. They can talk on the phone. Um, you know, there's also ways to to find connections. You know, with the new virtual world, especially now, but even before the COVIDs, there's a lot of online stuff, and uh, it's 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 better. It fills a void. There is such a massive void. Um, I think it's good, but there's a lot of there are a lot of pitfalls in the online because there's a lot of people saying stupid things that aren't true or they just don't have, they don't know. They just, I don't think there's bad intentions, but some of the online stuff is a little rough. So yeah, we do our best with our website and our online tools. Um, and, uh, but I think the best thing was the in-person groups. Um, now that we've got virtual, um, ones that have been carefully kind of, cultivated over the years that have a good uh, set of core guys that are leading it. Cause uh, you really need that. Um, there are some people that are really skilled at this. And if you like, for instance, we have a lot of doctors that connect uh, patients to our services and uh, 
many times we've had them come in and they'll, they'll even announce who they are. They'll just kind of come in five minutes late into a meeting when we were meeting a person and eventually we kind of figure out, it's like, so make sure before you send people to groups that, that it's, it's, it's legit, you know, cause uh, we, we, we're all going to try our best, but there's clearly some that uh, have been able to figure out how to provide good support. So I think that's the whole key is get people connected um, and let them have their network wherever it is. And it, it can work different. What, what works for one isn't the answer for the other. You know? And it doesn't have to be a flag in the yard, but as long as you somehow find out that uh, you know you, you get a neighbor that has it and you guys are, can become friends, it will be a life-changing thing. So that's my keys to support. Now, there was also a lot of talk today about these disparities. So I wanted to highlight some statistics that, uh, that we see all the time. Um, it, it is so tragic. The African-American men are almost twice as likely to be diagnosed with prostate cancer uh, than, uh, than white men. And that, that's just crazy. It can't be genetics. There's a lot of other factors. There's one of the biggest studies going on to address this now is is really pulling together a lot of different things it's been let out of the prostate cancer foundation and we are doing everything we can connect people to it um and so if you want to find out more sign up on our website put in your name phone number and email and our newsletters will include information on things that are going on um we are a nonprofit, all volunteer have been for 10 years now um, we put 100% of our proceeds back, and we haven't even ever done a fundraiser. So we just kind of let people help us, and we put it to our very, very best uses. Um, and so that's, that's going on out there. The other thing is the African-American men are dying at more than twice the rate. So they're getting more aggressive cancers, and then their access to care, their reluctance, um, it's 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 a really tragic situation um and then here, here's the other part only one third of the men so this is the high risk population so oftentimes there's family history african-american men they're high risk just by by that alone and only one third of them in our target audience of where they should be screened have been screened and that is tragic this is a solvable disparity. I don't know if you can completely eliminate it, but it is clear. I've always thought that if you find the biggest problem and you start chipping away at it, that's where you make the biggest difference. And so we've been seeing this disparity for a decade and the COVIDs are highlighting it. And it almost feels like the same exact set of, uh, factors are coming into play and we want to see this change because this is fixable this is addressable and uh, you know I guess the sobering the good news is that almost 100 percent of these men will be alive in five years if we catch them so if we can we can get that 33 percent to 75 percent 80 percent 90 percent close it then we, we can save, you know, so many families from losing their dads and grandpas prematurely. And uh, that, that's what our mission is. And that's what we're trying to do. Um, we asked our guys if they had any tips. We've been very fortunate to have uh, had different opportunities over the years to address Men's Health Month, different uh, forums. Uh, there was a a university wanted to do a story on Men's Health Month recently. And so I asked our guys, if they had any tips, what would you tell, you know, all the men out there, if, if you, had the, uh, you had the podium and everyone was listening, and, and this is basically the highlights of what they came up with is, uh, don't wait until you're in pain to see your doctors. You know, the, the doctors have told us that what happens is the men wait until their knee hurts and then they come in. They wait until they got a fever and then they come in. And so the doctor rightly focuses on 
fixing that knee, dressing that flu. But you got to go in, be proactive, and get an annual checkup. Form a relationship with your doctor. You know, get to know them. Let them get to know you and do it when you're not sick and do it, do it every year. And uh, one of the things was, uh, you know, these guys, they don't wait till the car is dead on the side of the road before they fix it. They hear a little, a little noise. They get that oil change. They get everything checked. You know, they're, they're treating the cars better than their bodies. And uh, these guys that have dealt with the cancers have, have been in these categories. They have been taking better care of their cars and their bodies. And uh, they, they don't like that. They, they were trying to uh, tell all the men out there, get on with it. You know, just, just suck it up, change it. Um, why it's this way? Uh, a lot of factors, but it's not the answer. Um, the ladies are way smarter. These guys will tell you how stupid all men are. And I know you ladies would appreciate hearing these guys say it, and they say it all the time. And so follow the, follow the ladies' lead. You know, they're going in every year and you need to do the same. And then go prepared when you are going to see your doctor. Write things down. Keep notes of what's going on. What is, what is working for you? What hasn't been working? Um, and so you go in and make sure you have answered all your questions before you walk out of that doctor's office. Um, and then find out about your family history. You know, I, it, it's not healthy to keep this thing a secret. How we can get these family histories shared, it's a wide variety of ways, but you know, holidays are coming up, Thanksgiving and Christmas, and I know we're not all supposed to get together, but we're gonna do things, right? When, when those opportunities arise, um, don't, don't just talk about the Chiefs. You know, we love the Chiefs, but if there's something going on that people need to know about, share it. It can save the lives of people that you love. Another thing is to be honest. Um, we are kind of raised as guys to pretend like there's, there's uh, nothing wrong or fine. And that kind of works for a while. It works until you're 30, 40, maybe 50 years old. But at some point, just pretending like there's nothing wrong doesn't work. And if you identify problems early and you share it, you're honest with, with uh, those around you, with your doctor, then, then there's ways to nip these things in the bud and before they become big, unsolvable problems. And so those are our tips from survivors to all men. And they also had a few tips for the docs. Um, they want to know, they want you to know they're doing their part. We're going out in the community. They're doing everything they can to get all the men aware that they come see you and they come see you on a regular basis. And so we're doing our part. We want you to do your part and to screen these guys. It's, it's not what you know that'll get you. It, excuse me, I got that backward. It's what you don't know that will get you. And these guys have a right to know. There, there's been challenges with their guidelines and they're, they're better, but they're still a little outdated. Um, it's a long ongoing saga that yeah, people get kind of fired up about. But in the end though, the guidelines are, are a, little, a little wrong. And the thing is the testing options have improved greatly. The, these MRI guided biopsies, the genetic test to determine whether it's aggressive or not, it's way beyond Gleason scores now. And so the idea of, of identifying cancers that are overtreated, that's a thing of the past. It really is. There's so much information now. So, so, so we're doing our part getting guys to you and the technology is improving, the skills are improving, we're lobbying and trying to get everyone all the help that they need to solve this. And so please do your part in helping save all these men and helping them live a long, healthy life. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for everything you're doing. Have a great evening.